Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today we're talking about a vintage combat pistol, the Colt M1911 series, or M1911 and M1911A1. In 1890, the U.S. Army was looking for a new handgun to replace its, its current M1892 Colt revolver, chambered in 38 long. Now, the 38 long was definitely not a powerful cartridge, and they had found in their Moral guerrilla war in the Philippines that it was a very ineffective man stopper. So at that point, uh, Colonel Thompson decided he wanted a 45 caliber pistol to replace that aging revolver. Now the 38 long, as I said, it proved very very poor as a man stopper. You only had six rounds. 45, always bigger, was better. Uh, so the decision was made, and there was a trial that was held. You know, in the 1906 trials, there were seven handguns that competed for the U.S. military's next combat pistol. The first was a Browning-designed M1910 that was manufactured by Colt. You'll find out that there are many pistols that have a lot of John Browning's features. And the M1910 was one of those pistols that was sold to Colt uh, for them to develop, which in Colt's history, uh, they very rarely developed anything in-house. It was mostly other people's designs that they purchased, and then they, met, they modified it or manufactured it for sale. The seven pistols that were tried in the 1906 trials were the Colt M1910, the Bergman, the DWM, Savage, Noble, Webley, and the White Merrill. The Bergman, Noble, and Webley were eliminated very quickly. The final one standing would be the Colt M1910, which was able to go through 6,000 rounds within a... In March of 1911, the Colt pistol was now renamed the 1911. In 1917, it was renamed the Model 1911. In 1920, it was renamed the M1911. The pistol we see here is an early World War I 1911. Now, this pistol has had some changes from its original configuration, which is very common. When the M1911A1 was introduced, there were several parts that were improved, which we're going to get into. So when the early 1911s would have t problems and they would go through the armory and they would be refurbished, some of the parts would be replaced by the new 1911A1 parts. And I'm going to point these parts out to you right now. Originally, the 1911 had a longer trigger. It was uh, much longer. This is the M1911A1 type trigger, which is more recessed in place. But again, this pistol, when it went through refurbishment, uh, had that part put in there. Also, it was the hammer. The hammer was much narrower on the 1911, and this was replaced with the uh, M1911 hammer. Also, the safety. The safety on here had the checkering on the top, which is also an M1911 part. And the tang here is a little bit different as well, which is also... But you will notice we see a flat mainspring housing. You will also see that we have a lanyard loop on the bottom. We have wooden grips. This is a thicker front sight compared to the 1911 as well. Now, we have a single-action pistol. Now, in 1911, and even up until the days of World War II, this pistol would definitely be considered state-of-the-art, considering the two guns that it was competing against. It was competing against the Luger, and it was competing against the P-38. So the features of the pistol are, first, you have your hammer, you have a grip safety, you have a hammer safety. So basically how this pistol works is it's single action only. The hammer has to be physically cocked back for it to fire. Now, you're able to engage the safety to have it in a cocked lock position so you can carry the pistol loaded. However, this pistol was long before there was any kind of firing pin safeties. So if this pistol was to be dropped from, say, about five feet on the muzzle, just the inertia from the uh, firing pin uh, would be able to set off the cartridge. So for as far as it's being safe to carry loaded, uh, it was as long as it wasn't dropped. So we have a Browning design, so we have a Browning-linked locking system. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this apart. We're going to go through it. It was fed from a seven-round single-column magazine. So what we're going to do is disassemble. We're going to check to make sure we're empty. I'm going to engage the safety. Now I'm sure there's different ways people like to do this, but this is generally how I do it. We push inward on the plunger. We're going to rotate the barrel bushing to, uh, clock, counterclockwise. We're going to remove the bushing. And then what we're going to do, drop the safety. We're going to pull that back just until it lines up like so with that little notch. Then we're going to push the uh, slide catch from the right side. Pull right out, and now frame comes right off. We can remove the recoil spring assembly. We also have to remove the barrel bushing. Drop the link down, and we can now push the barrel through and remove. Now what we have here is a link system. As you can see, we have a link which is pinned in place. Now this is one of the problems that this pistol out the head was this pin would, would would remove. It could fall out, and we'd be and you wouldn't be able to hold the link into place. Now, what was mostly done is these were peened into place, so this pin couldn't be removed, but you definitely would see pistols where that would come loose. 
P located on the side of the barrel here shows that this was bag particle and proof tested. It was used, utilized a proof cartridge. That would be true on every Colt uh, barrel assembly that was used at any Colt uh, automatic pistol, as well as their rifle bolts. So we have a relatively simple design. Uh, this is certainly very well machined for its time. You can see the we have the ejector. And now looking at the slide, uh, you gave, you're able to see that the extractor is inserted into the slide from the rear. You do have a spring-loaded firing pin. And again, we have the front sight and the rear sight. These are very crude sights, but they're basically designed as combat sights. You'll see that we have the manual safety on the side and we have the grip safety. Now, if the grip safety is not pushed in, the hammer cannot move forward. Once the grip safety is pushed in, we're able to release the, the hammer to fire. We do have a quarter cock position on there, which will keep the hammer from resting on the firing pin. However, as I said before, if this was to be dropped muzzle down from five feet or so, the inertia from the firing pin will be enough to set the cartridge off. The hammer doesn't need to move at all. So the real safety issue is within the, the firing pin itself. Reassembly, very simple. As you'll see we have the locking surfaces on the barrel. And you will see in the inside of the slide, we have the two locking surfaces inside the slide. That's where, the, that's where the barrel will lock in place. For reassembly, we have to make sure that we have the link in the down position. Drop into place until it locks in place. We're going to insert the barrel bushing. Rotate it to the left. Now we're going to insert the recoil spring and guide from the inside. We have to make sure that the two legs are face down on the barrel. Now we have to make sure we have the link now in the down position. We're going to slide forward on the slide. Now what we're going to do is hold it in the barrel and we're going to look through the hole until we see that link in place. Once we have the link in place, we're going to insert the slides ca slide catch. And now we're going to go back to that same notch that's going to enable us to push The slide catch into place. Now we're going to push the slide forward, lock position. We're going to insert our plunger and we're going to rotate that bushing back in place. Now it's going to lock. So there we have the 1911. In 1926, there were some changes that were made to the 1911 to upgrade it to the new M1911A1 pistol, which we see right here. Now, the M1911 had some changes that were made, and those would include an arched mainspring housing, which made the pistol much more comfortable, extended grip safety, which was a lot more comfortable for the web of your hand. This was always a big contention for me, uh, is not being a 1911 fan, because I would always have, when I shot... Uh, a big bruise or a, a blister that would form in the web of my hand just because of the way this this the script safety was. But that generally is a problem that I had had. Also, the trigger was shortened and there was a nice knurling that was put on here. And also there was an addition of a finger groove right in here so the it was more comfortable on your finger rather than having a sharp edge as you would see right here. Now the M1911A1 serial number would be 700,000 and above. The first M1911s were manufactured in February of 1924, right before World War II. Now once the production commenced, there were some other additions that were made for modifications for improvement, which would include a stronger hammer trigger spring, a uh, wider front sight post uh, versus the thinner one that was on the M1911. Now the M1911, that front sight post was known to peen over if it was to be damaged or if it was to be uh, smacked in anything metal. Uh, it had a tendency for it to deform, which would definitely affect the accuracy of the pistol. Another improvement was the serration that you would have on the top of the, uh, the safety, which would make it much easier for your, your finger not to slip off of it, which was definitely an improvement over the smooth one that was original. And they also increased the width of the hammer. Again, the original one was a little bit more narrow, and I think it was a little bit more painful on the finger, at least it was on mine, to be able to pull back by having that wider spur on there. Uh, I felt that it was much easier for it to be able to manipulate. And also, you had polymer handguards instead of wood. Now, this was certainly less expensive, and it was more durable. The wood grip panels were known to swell with water and with, with humidity and rain, and they were also known to splinter and to break. The polymer eliminated that possibility, so you had a much more durable military-type hand grip. Now, one post-World War II change that you had on here was a wider safety lever. Uh, the lever was increased in, in, in width uh, to make it more easily to grasp. That was pretty much the last change that was ever made, and that was around 19, that was 1949. 
1935 and 1938, two other pistols that would come out. Those two pistols, which in my opinion, would now make the 1911 obsolete. And they would also put us on track for our newer, modern handguns that would be utilized for military services. Now, in 1935, that first pistol would be another Browning design. It would be the Browning High Power. This found itself being used by both the Axis and the Allied, Allied services. Now, what we have here is a basic 1911 design, but we had some very important changes uh, for durability and magazine. Now, the European cartridge was the 9mm. The U.S. would be the only military in history to utilize the 45 caliber. Uh, it was found by the Europeans uh, with the development of the 9x19 cartridge that it was a much more reliably feeding, and the guns were also more durable than the 1911. The uh, 9, 9mm offered you more of a penet more penetration and controllability uh, for your, your non-professional shooter than that of the 1911. Uh, granted, you know, the United States was always a country of uh, weapons uh, connoisseurs. You know, they had a lot of training with weapons. But even up to 1985, with the adoption of the M9, you still found people that were shooting better with the 9mm than they were 45. We're talking novice who first had their pistols put in their hands in the, in, in the military. So he went to a 9mm caliber pistol. We also went with a 14 or 15 round magazine. This was a major improvement over the seven rounds of the 1911. You were actually able to put some cover fire down with it. So you had some suppressive uh, fire capability if necessary. And being able to carry double the rounds and in case you carry spare magazine, you can you know, triple and quadruple the amount of rounds that you would carry. So this was a major, major improvement. Another major improvement was to the locking system. We're going to take a look at that right now to see what that was. For this assembly with the Browning High Power, we're going to go all the way to the rear. We're going to engage the safety. Now we're going to push the disassembling latch lever out. And we're going to go forward. We got rid of the link that was part of the barrel. So we have a link that's basically on the operating rod right now. This was a major uh, reliability enhancement. We have a more durable piece right here for as far as the locking mechanism. It was not prone to break like that of the, uh, the link on 1911. And the locking pin that was put in there. Uh, and also when it was disassembled, you were a lot less likely to lose any parts if that was to happen. So what we had here was a modified Browning locking system. As you can see here, we still have the two locking surfaces on the top and the bottom. So the locking hasn't really changed. It's the pivoting area down here which has changed. And this was a vast improvement in durability and reliability over the Browning linked system. So now we have an improvement over the 1911 of locking system and we have an improvement over higher magazine capacity. And another issue or another improvement, I don't want to not call this an improvement, but another modification that was made was a magazine safety. We'll put this back together and we'll take a look at that. For the reassembly, we're going to pull the slide back to the rear. We're going to lock that back in place. We're going to reinsert the slide catch. And now there was a change that was made that I'm not very fond of, but they were at the time, and it was referred to as a magazine safety. With the magazine out, the pistol would not fire. Put the magazine in, now it would fire. So this was the first pistol, 1938. Germany came out with the Walther P38. Now this was also a 9mm caliber pistol, however it had a single column magazine which held 9 rounds. Now where do we see the big changes here? Well, we were able to have a double action pistol, meaning the safety engaged. Our first pull was a long heavy double action pull, then after the pistol would fire it would come back into a single action. So what this enabled you to do was carry the pistol loaded safely with the hammer forward. And it also introduced a decocking lever. Now, when you'd have a 1911 and you'd have it in the cock position, if you wanted to decock it, you would have to hold the safety down and ride the hammer forward until it hit the quarter cock, which could be dangerous. If that was the slip, the pistol could go off, take your finger off. So to stop that, what the Germans did was they added a decocking lever. Now you have a manual safety engaged. Flip the safety up, you're ready to fire again. So the two major features that were taken from this magazine capacity, double action with a decocker. And another interesting thing about the P38 is the operating mechanism. It does not utilize any of the Browning type locking mechanisms. This is something we're going to drop this down. 
This pistol, on the other hand, utilizes a facilitating block, which, you, as you will see, it's a winged locking block. And those of you who are familiar with the M9 pistol, it's the exact same kind of a locking block. Now, what this does is it changes the type of recoil from more of a snap to more of a push. Um, I'm actually quite fond of this mechanism. However, it has proven not to be nearly as reliable or durable as the Browning type tilting locking barrel mechanisms. But uh, this was definitely an improvement for as far as the accuracy of the pistol. Another important feature on the P38 was the inclusion of a firing pin safety. Now, this has become a, a major component of every single combat pistol that we have today. What this does is it prevents the frame pin from going forward unless the trigger is pulled all the way to the rear. So we look at the P38, it brings a lot to the table. Firing pin block, double action, single action, manual safety, which can be engaged or disengaged, which makes this pistol safe to carry. Reassembly, we drop right in like so, we put it to the lock position. Also notice that the recoil springs are inside of the receiver. There's two of them. It's not your conventional uh, type of a recoil spring. When we put this back together, we have to be sure that that hammer is in the forward position. So now we look at these two pistols. We're going to go to the next generation U.S. military pistol. So 1985 brings us to the XM9 program. Now, for as far as 1911 was concerned, the last shipment the U.S. government got of new M1911s was 1950s. It was during the Korean War. So from that time period to 1985, the 1911 was still the standard sidearm of the U.S. military. However, they were very old, very aging. Uh, many of those pistols, you had to take apart several to make one that would work. Um, the pistol was just not really a priority for the U.S. government because um, it, it, it's just a, such a low purpose uh, for as far as its use. But once the NATO trials came about, it also was found that the 9mm was, was going to be the NATO standard cartridge. And as NATO was put forward, everybody was to be on the same page for as far as ammunition. So everybody would have compatible ammunition that was in relation to like the 7.62 NATO, the 5.56 NATO, as well as the 9mm. Now, when we look at the M9 pistol, we're going to be seeing a lot of the Walther P38 with the double action, the single action, the decocker. Now, we're going to see the Browning High Power in the 15-shot magazine. And also, we're going to see from the P38 the facilitating locking mechanism on the, on the Browning M9 as well. So, you'll see how those pistols uh, really uh, geared or really were the future of the way uh, the U.S. military was going to be looking at handguns. Now, uh, we're not going to talk too much in detail about the M9 or the pistols coming forward just due to the fact they have their own videos. But since we do have all these pistols, I want to show you more of the evolution of the U.S. military's pistols. So, 1985, we had the M9 pistol. In 1996, SOCOM was developed, and they had their first program uh, for a joint weapons, weapon for the entire SOCOM, or all special forces. It was referred to as the Mark 23. Now, the Mark 23, or I like to call it, is the Crusader pistol. They went back to the 45 caliber. Now, this pistol was chambered in 45. Now, there is nobody out there that will say that when you hit a target with a 45 caliber ball round, it is going to be more effective than hitting with a lighter 9mm round. Uh, that's not that's not debatable. However, when it came to SOCOM, they were more concerned about incapacitation. This was referred to as the offensive uh, offensive handgun weapon system, which was designed as a primary weapon. You had a pistol, laser module, and you had a sound suppressor. It was designed for sentry incapacitation. But another important thing about this pistol, this was the first joint weapons program that SOCOM went through to develop a weapon that was going to be for all services. Now, this pistol was adopted uh, by SOCOM. However, it saw very, very limited use due to the fact that it was large, and they didn't like to carry it. Um, so, also, this pistol was developed during much peacetime, where SOCOM operators got very used to the uh, high-velocity high, high velocity 9 millimeter cartridge, which had a 15-shot capacity magazine. They preferred the low, lighter recoil, more accurate pistol with a higher capacity of the SIG-226 or the Beretta M9. Later, the Marine Corps, who was also using the M9, decided they wanted some changes to be made to the pistol. They were not happy with the exact U.S. government design of the M9, so they got together with Beretta and manufactured a new pistol for them called the M9A1. Now, the M9A1 was not the U.S. government M9A1. This was a COTS pistol, or commercial off-the-shelf pistol. Uh, what that meant was there was no TDP for this. Uh, the Marine Corps was free to say what they wanted changed without having to go to the Army to make changes to the actual M9. 
So the changes they had was they had an accessory rail so they could mount a weapons light or a laser. Also, they had some modifications to the back strap and the front strap for as far as checkering to make it easier for them to handle when they had wet hands or muddy hands. Uh, it also was able to take on a lot of the enhancements that had been made to the Beretta series over the intervening 20 years or so that it was in service. The, the mil-spec M9 still has a lot of production from 1985 for as far as the locking block and so forth. There have been many updates of the locking block to make it that much more durable and reliable. In fact, significantly, you're looking at probably, you know, uh, six to 7,000 rounds of durability of a locking block up to 17 to 20,000 rounds. This was able to have all those updated parts that the original M9 was not, so that was very wise. Now comes 2018, new weapons trial, the XM-17. We now have the, the Sig Sauer M17 weapon. This is the current issue uh, military pistol that is, was just recently adopted and is now going through uh, the process of, of being issued. Uh, I anticipate it's going to be quite a few years before you see this replace the M9 altogether. But we have a modern polymer frame pistol, striker fired, ability to mount optics on the top. We have a live cartridge indicator on here. And again, we have striker fired. We do have a manual safety. And we also have a laser module here where we have an infrared laser as well as a as a white light or LED. Now, there was one other attempt to go back to the 1911 that was around the 2016 time period. It was the Colt M45A1 that was purchased by the Marine Corps. Now, the, at that time, the CEO of Colt, General William Keyes, was a three-star Marine general. And like most Marines, they're very, very hell-bent on tradition. Uh, they love their 1911s. And somehow they were able to uh, work together and build this new M1911 for uh, U.S. Marine Corps use. They did some modifications on the M45A1, but not really a lot. Certainly nothing to make this thing suitable for uh, combat use in this day and age. And although it was tradition and everybody loved it, uh, it was found once it was put into combat, they were putting our soldiers at risk or our Marines at risk by giving them a handgun that was outdated. It was obsolete. You're going up against pistols that have 16 to 18 shots. You're going against lighter recoil. You're going against more accuracy, um, a more durable finish. In fact, even the, uh, the Colt M45A1 had cracked slides and frames during the, during the development of it. So that pistol's uh, history with the Marine Corps was very, very short. Uh, they ended up adopting Glock 19 pistols to replace it uh, so our boys would not be outgunned uh, and, uh, and disadvantaged overseas. Now, there are many people who just don't want to get rid of tradition. They don't want to realize that this pistol, uh, although it was up to date in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, um, that after World War II, this pistol was obsolete. Uh, the rest of the world went to 9mm. They went to uh, the former Walther designs, the Browning High Power designs, and then eventually to the Beretta, the Glock, uh, the Sig designs. The U.S. military, just because it was not a priority of theirs, they stuck with what they had. It wasn't a big deal. They were more concerned about changing out rifles and, and modernizing rifles. And when the M9 was adopted, uh, a lot of people thought that uh, this was the only gun the U.S. military should have, and you know they didn't care anything else other than what that tradition was. They've tried it. Our Marshal Sock guys and some of our Special Forces guys have kept it. Most of them have gotten rid of them eventually. But... You know, the pistol is obsolete. We have much better options right now. For as far as its commercial use, it is still probably one of the more uh, popular pistols here in the United States. There's a lot of people who use them for competition. There are some guys who use these for carry, fortunately, uh, in the, the Series 80s pistols. Colt went ahead and updated it with a uh, firing pin block mechanism, so it eliminated that drop, you know, for the safety of this thing going off if you dropped it. And so it had those uh, changes for a carry concealed pistol. I'm not fine of carrying cocked and locked. Some people had no problem with that. You know, good for them. Um, you know, the pistol, for as far as its commercial use, you know, it's great. But uh, for as far as military, it saw it had its day. Uh, it had its time where it was uh, it was high tech or it was uh, one of the best in the world. But uh, you know, times do change. Uh, technology does evolve, and we have to evolve with it. And as much as we do like tradition, uh, when it comes to our military, our military needs the best equipment that's available. And that has nothing to do with tradition or, you know, what people think. It is what is going to be best for those boys in combat. And that's where we went in 1985. There's no doubt in my mind that this was a superior pistol. It was more durable, more reliable. Uh, it was more accurate for the average shooter. Uh, in fact, when I went to basic training in 1991, uh, we were one of the first uh, units that, that qualified on the M9s, and we also had an M1911s there. 
And we noticed that when we had the numbers and we looked at the numbers, the number of people who qualified expert with the M9, that number was barely who qualified on the first try with the M1911. So we're taking, you know, boys from all over the country, some who've never even touched a handgun, and they shot much better with this pistol. So it, it shows how that was that evolution was was much better to where we are today. Now I know many of you people are going to say that you uh, how dare me say any blasphemy or anything negative about the 1911. Uh, I'm just giving you from a historical perspective uh, and what uh, and what I see. Um, you know, you make up your own mind. You can buy any, any gun you want, certainly. But uh, is the history of the 1911? Uh, we see how it's gone from the original pistol to the 1911, and then we were able just to go through uh, some of the pistols that influenced. Uh, the modern day um, pistol. So the thing we're going to do now is we're going to go to the range and we're going to see how the M1911 and M1911 A1 shoot. Now, for old girls, these pistols did shoot very, very well. Uh, this particular pistol here, uh, 1911, came in from one of our viewers. Um, it was a uh, this is a real World War II era 1911A1, and the M1911 we have here. This came from uh, Brandon at the uh, gun room in Shenandoah, and this one here was a, this was a 1918 pistol. Uh, so I was sort of nervous to even shoot it, but uh, she shot just as well for an old girl. Look at the specifications of the M1911A pistol. We have a, ca a caliber 45 automatic. It's a short action recoil with a barrel length of 5.03 inches. Uh, the overall length is 8.25 inches with a weight of 39 ounces. Again, we're looking at a steel frame and slide. Mag capacity of 7 plus 1 with a single action trigger. So I hope you all did enjoy this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share. Thank you.